All right, so your microscope it says provides magnification of tissues. It could be ceiling mounted on a rolling base. The parts of it, it has the optical lens system, the magnification, the focus controls, like all the handles. Um, they have the eye pieces. One is going to be for the doctor to look in, and then you're also going to have another set of eye pieces um, for like an assistant, maybe for us if it's just us helping him, or sometimes there's a third piece. So you're going to have multiple eye pieces, okay, for sure on your microscope. The magnification basically, it says this provides the magnification, like the optical lens provides it, um, and the resolving power to do all of the work. You can range if you do like, you know, you zoom on your camera, you zoom on a, any kind of like, you know, your cell phone or regular camera, you zoom in. We do the same thing with the microscope, okay? You can go, it says from like 100 to 400 millimeters. Um, they can really focus. Now, in the old days, we had to actually change out the lens if they wanted like a 250 lens. Nowadays, the new microscopes are pretty much like digital or just a turn of a knob and it changes the lens internally. So we don't have to do that, you know, specifically. Um, it's just basically whatever magnification they want in order to get a clear photo and clear, a clear viewing of it. Um, let's see, what else is on my note pages? All right, you can attach a laser to your microscope as well. So if we're doing ear procedures, they usually, or even doing, um, throat procedures and we're taking biopsies and we have to laser something, you may have the nurse in there and you guys are going to set up a laser handpiece to your microscope. Um, that way we can go ahead and seal, burn, cauterize, whatever it is that we need. Um, we could also hook it up to a camera system so that way we can see exactly what's on TV for it if we don't have ocular pieces to look in. We sometimes have to drape these microscopes, which is not the most fun thing in the world, but they have to be sterile in order for the doctor to use them. So sometimes we have a huge clear plastic piece that we're going to have to drape over the entire machine with the assistance of a nurse. So she's going to have to kind of reach on the inside and grab the drape while we go from the outside. Or Chabert and a lot of other places um, just sterilize the actual hand pieces, which can cover the knobs and the handles that the doctors need to touch to use to rotate the buttons and, and to move it. So that way they don't have the big bulky plastic covering on it. It's just handle coverings that pop on and everything you need to touch now has a sterile handle. Okay. Um, they can operate these microscopes by hand control or foot control. So you'll notice a lot of the eye doctors go in and um, take their shoes off once they sit down and they start operating with just like their socks because they want to feel all the controls on the foot piece. All right, that's how they kind of learn to do it that way. All right, let's see. You don't have to worry about the illumination. But on to video monitors, recorders, and cameras, all of this can be attached to your laparoscopes or your microscopes. Okay? That way we can see it on the TV screen. We can snap still shots. We can also record a video. All of this that we are recording can actually be um, filed for patient documentation. So usually when we do laparoscopic procedures, you'll hear the doctor say, okay, take a shot of that. And we'll press a button on the camera head. It takes a still shot. Then the nurse can actually print the photos out. There's a printer attached to the tower. And then they put it in the patient's um, record. So that way they have an actual photo of what we saw in surgery. Okay, so all of that can be, you know, patient records. Um, Next is your fiber optic headlamps and light source. You see on page 258, the fiber optic headlamp. This is like, okay, if you go frog and you go bull you know, whatever you wear, well, this is a lot more of a little better uh, headlamp. So this is when they need additional lighting for the op site. Because we do have the big OR lights above us, but they might need to lean over the patient, look at their thyroid area, you know, their throat, their ears, 
and they might put their head in the weight of the light source. So by them wearing this fiber optic headlamp, it's giving them their own little light beam on the off site. Okay, we still use the overheads, but by them wearing this, nothing will block the light. Okay, so it's really good for, um, for them to kind of hone in on their specific little small area and give them some more light. The thing to look at this is how it's hooked up. So you can kind of see on the picture on 258, there's a black cord, like it kind of goes over his head and then it drapes down behind his neck. What happens is um, it's gonna be clipped to his pants because he has to put this on before he scrubs. Once he comes in, he's, he's already scrubbed, we've gowned and gloved him. The nurse is gonna take the cord and she's going to attach it to a separate light source that's going to be on a rolling cart behind him. So he is actually connected to a box while he's operating for the light source. Okay. Now this is, like I said, it's going to be in your supply book on um, page 48 and you'll actually see the light source that I'm talking about. Okay. Another thing they have is um, lighted retractors that you can see here in the top left. This would also get plugged into the same source as his headlamp. We use this a lot for like breast mastectomies and procedures like that. So you can actually, if you have a deep cavity and we need to see deep down in there, these lighted retractors act just like a normal retractor, but they have a little beam coming out on the end of it if you put a light source on it. Okay, so that way once we lift up the tissue, there's light going back there. Okay, if we are in like a deep area. All right, um, another thing about your light sources, um, you have to make sure that when you connect your cable, your light cord to your scopes or wherever, um, make sure that you don't have it sitting on your drapes, okay? Or you ask the nurse to turn it off because this is gonna start a fire. If you let your light source sit on your drapes or some towels, that beam is really, really, really hot. Okay. Um, and it's going to burn whatever it's, you know, focused on. So you have to make sure that when the nurse plugs in the light source, if you're not ready to use it, you can ask her to put it on standby. Okay. Until the doctor's ready to use it. Or if you do hook it up, you have to put it to your endoscope and maybe leave it hanging off of your Mayo stand, like midair. Don't let it touch the drapes on the patient or anything. And I can promise you these light are so hot the fire will start to sizzle the drape and make a hole in it in a matter of seconds um we've had it happen a lot of the doctors you know once they're done with something they unplug the light source they take off the camera head and they throw everything down on the drape well then next thing you know i'm looking and there's a hole sizzling because i didn't know he undid everything so i'm like dude like pick up the light source so you have to make sure you communicate with your nurse for her to turn it off or make sure I'm not putting it on anything that can start a fire, okay? It gets that hot quickly. All right, are there any questions so far that you guys can think of? It's a lot of small little paragraphs about different, um, you know, pieces of equipment. So like what I said, you got to read all of them, look in your supply book. Um, I mean, Google is your friend. If you want to Google something, you know, go ahead and look at it. Look at more pictures, and that way you can kind of get a better understanding, okay? All right, the pulse lavage, you're going to see a lot more when you get to, like, ortho. Um, this is something that we use to clean out wounds. Let me put my screen back. Something we use to clean out wounds. Um, and if you notice, okay, this is it right here. They have different, you know, makes and models of it. Um, they usually are just battery powered. So they have a pack of batteries in there. So I'm like double A batteries. 
anything that's kind of infected. So let's say I come in from a motor vehicle accident and my arm is sliced open and it's like full of like road dirt and things like that. We could take this pulse lavage, we connect it to um, a suction, and we also connect it to irrigation. And when you press it, it's battery operated. You guys can go Google a video of it. And you have that shield guard to kind of protect the water from coming back at you. And you just rub it up and down the wound and it, it's like high pressured water and it'll suck it back up. So it's almost like you're pressure washing the wound. And that's exactly kind of what it is. Um, so we do use it a lot in ortho, especially when we're going to do implants, um, to make sure that the area is nice and clean, or if there's any kind of traumatic wound, then, um, you know, you want to make sure you get it super, super clean. So that's your pulse lavage. All right, your phaco emulsifier, um, and your different units like that. This is something that for sure you're going to wait and see like more in chapter 16 is what, what I just did with the other class. So just a basic definition, you have to know that it uses ultrasonic energy. And what it does is it fragments the, the lens and then it'll suck it up at the same time. And then they can go ahead and put in a new lens. All right. So they have some updated machines out there now, so they may not always look like what's in the textbook or whatever, uh, but just know that the type of energy it uses and what does it do? Fragments and then aspirates and sucks up the lens, okay? What does it suck up? It, the lens in your eyeball. Oh, okay. Yeah, you might have to just kind of Google yourself like a little anatomy photo, look at the lens. It's what um, refracts and lets you see like nearsighted, farsightedness. Um, so people get cataracts, you know, pets get cataracts. They have like a cloudy lens. Their eyeball kind of looks freaky sometimes. So they would go into surgery. The phaco emulsifier would crack up that cloudy lens, just suck it up. It's like breaking glass, get all the pieces out. And then they put in an artificial clear. Lens. All right, as far as cryotherapy goes, what I want you to know is what it uses. So it says liquid nitrogen, freon, or carbon dioxide gas, um, and that it delivers extreme cold through the insulated tip, okay, through the probe. So cryo means cold. As if you could think of that and remember that, then you're good, okay? So part of the cryo probe, though, is we use it in neural a lot for brain tumors because it will only take the bad tissue, all right? It's an insulated probe to only take the diseased tissue um, and it's not going to damage any healthy surrounding tissue. So when we go to brain surgery, we use a cryoprobe, uh, we can take out the tumor and the disease part and it's not gonna take away that healthy brain tissue. We also use it in eyeballs to repair your retinal detachment. So that way they could take the cryoprobe, put it into the eyeball, and then wherever they see a hole, they can freeze it and let it scar up and reattach and close. Okay, so that way it can repair retinal detachment. So that's it for the cryo. You can have it. All right, let's see. Insufflators. All right, so this is something you have to be really familiar with is your insufflator. You have to know what is going into the abdomen, which is carbon dioxide. Your CO2 is being infused. Okay. The insufflator is the machine that actually is going to supply the gas. Um, and then it goes through a Varys needle or a Hassan trocar to insert the gas into the abdomen. You're gonna learn all of these steps in chapter 13, but now they're just introducing like the actual pieces to you, okay? They have something on there about you can have a warmer and a humidifier attached to help maintain the patient's internal body temperature. Um, that's because you, you know, we always wanna maintain their temperature. If we put in something that's too cold on the inside, we're gonna, you know, their temperature is gonna drop. So sometimes there is a little warmer humidifier that the CO2 will pass through first to warm up and then it goes and insufflates the belly. Um, 
the pressure is something that I've seen on a lot of exams, especially for the certification. Uh, you want to know that it is 12 to 15 milligrams that is going to be, I mean, millimeters that's going to be in the um, abdomen. Okay, so when they look at this insufflator machine um, on the next page. Okay, this is the insufflator machine. This is just one of them. You're going to have a tubing that looks like a suction tubing, but it's not. Okay, it has a filter on it. They're going to attach it to a varies needle, and then that needle is going to stick inside the abdomen, and the CO2 is going to flow. Once you kind of pop a hole in the peritoneum, that's where it needs to go. You have to break a hole in the peritoneum in order for your abdomen to insufflate. It's going to blow up. Everybody's going to look like they're about nine months pregnant, and then... Um, they go ahead, they take the various needle out, they put a trocar in, and then the endoscope goes in. And then we can do our working tools too. We'll add more trocars. So they blow up if, the belly with the gas so they can see. What's that? They blow up the belly with the gas so you can put a trocar in and you can see inside the belly. Is that why they do it? Yes. You can't see inside the belly if you don't insufflate it. Okay. Because everything's all smushed. So the point of the CO2 gas is to inflate like a hot air balloon so that way when we get in there it's all nice and like a big dome so that way nothing's stuck to each other okay and it took forever for that gas to go away after a laparoscopic procedure <laughs> if they can't deflate it all the most area that you feel it is going to be in like your, your uh, clavicle area your shoulder area so some doctors should deflate it we sit there, we press on the belly, we get as much as we can out. Um, a lot of doctors will take the suction and just suck it out for a little while. But yeah, you're not guaranteed to get all of that. Your body will absorb it. Um, but sometimes it's really painful to get it. Like I had a bubble caught like in my clavicle area for one of my surgeries. And that was like the most painful thing ever. It does suck, but they can't get it out. <laughs> so the insufflator is the machine that releases the CO2 through the insufflation tubing to the varies needle. Now, if you've had a lot of previous surgeries and they can't get that varies needle in, they use what's called the Hassan trocar. Um, and you can see it right here, it's a big trocar. Um, they have to do a cut down method with them. You can't just pop a hole in it and put it in. So they're gonna have to do like an incision, do a little retraction, find the peritoneal layer, cut it open, and then physically insert the trocar themselves um, without using a varies needle, okay? And then the insufflator tubing is going to attach to this trocar, and that's how it's gonna inflate the belly, okay? So that's your two options to inflate the belly with CO2. So you're gonna learn those steps in chapter 13, but you have to kind of know all of the, the items right now. Do you have any questions? So y'all know, y'all remember what gas is used, right? To inflate the belly? CO2. Yep, CO2. Okay. Um, the last little section is nerve stimulators. Um, we have two different types that you're going to see in surgery that we play with. So we have one right here that's a handheld nerve stimulator. Um, what happens is, and it explains it to you in the book, this little needle point right here, they're going to stick it into a muscle. Okay, let's say we're working on a parotid and we're removing the parotid gland from the cheek. So you want to make sure you preserve every nerve you come across. You don't want to give the patient permanent damage by cutting the nerve. So if I think I see something that looks like a nerve, and it might be a ligament, it might be a vessel, we just it might be scar tissue, but you don't want to cut it before you verify that it's not a nerve, okay? So you're going to take this needle, and I'm going to stick it into a muscle, any muscle, like around the face of the neck area, then you take the actual tip and you touch what you think is a nerve. And if it's a nerve, the electricity is going to activate through that cord into that muscle where you stuck that needle and the muscle should jump. 
okay, if it's a nerve. If it's not a nerve and you touch it and the muscle doesn't jump, then you know it's not a nerve. Then you can go ahead and cut it, okay? So you have to make sure that whenever we're doing delicate tissues um, that we have to preserve nerves. Now, the one right here, I put nerve stimulator and it has a rep kind. I mean like a, um, a company rep will come in, give us this hand piece, this cable is going to connect to a little um, black box that he has that he attached and he has a bunch of it looks like acupuncture needles that he's going to put into the patient in different areas and they're all going to go to this one black box so when the doctor wants to go and verify something's a nerve he's going to tell the representative hey look I, you know get ready to test so all he's going to do the doctor is going to take this nerve handle um, he's going to take the probe, he's going to touch what he thinks is a nerve, and the representative is there with a laptop, and he will be able to tell the doctor, yep, that's a nerve, like he's seeing like an EKG read almost on his screen. If the doctor touches something and it's no feedback whatsoever, then the rep will tell him, nope, that's nothing, and then the doctor can cut it, okay? So both of those items are really for us to make sure we verify nerves and we don't want to cut anything. If we happen to cut a nerve on a patient, then we have major uh, reconstruction surgery that we would have to try to do if we can get the nerves repaired back together. If not, those people are going to be left without a feeling or a function, okay, which is not good. Um, the other nerve stimulator you see right here is used for anesthesia. Whenever they put a patient to sleep, we can paralyze the patient to where all their muscles are not going to react. Because when we open their belly, we need to retract the belly open as wide as we can. And if they're not paralyzed, their muscles are automatically going to want to fight us and not allow us to open the belly. Okay. Also for intubation, if their muscles are really tight, anesthesia won't be able to intubate. Them. Okay, their neck will be really uh, tight. So they give them narcotics to paralyze them. Well, at the end of the surgery, they have to make sure they reverse all of that. So that way the patient can wake up. They're not going to be paralyzed per se anymore. Um, so this is a nerve stimulator. And what's going to happen is they're going to take those two silver balls. They're going to touch the patient on their face somewhere and it's going to stimulate them. And it's going to kind of make them like make this weird little scratchy face because um, it's firing their muscles. If they touch the patient's face and the patient has no reaction, then that means they're still deeply paralyzed. Okay. Anesthesia is going to have to do some more reversing. But if they touch them and their face squinches real bad, you know, you have a reaction, the muscles are jumping, then you know they're coming out of it. So the top two is what we're going to use in surgery and the bottom is what you're going to see anesthesia use for um for their purposes okay okay so i know that was a lot it's a lot of little things if you kind of go along with it um, but that's why i want you to make sure you read all the paragraphs Thoroughly look in your supply book, follow along with everything. Um, and like I said, if you have questions, please, like, I'm going to put up the little weekly discussion thing. If you have questions on there, you can do it, you know, post your questions on there. Um, send them to me, you know, in Canvas or something like that. I'll reply back to you. Um, it's only a 76 point test. Okay. Same format. But like I said, make sure you're looking at the listings and the red dots and everything that I told you, okay, to look at. Um, when we start talking about drapes, we will be back in school for that at least. So you guys are going to be able to see the drapes hands on and actually see what we're talking about. So that way it'll be a lot easier to study from, okay? Um, I'm going to try to make a list of everything that we usually pull out for chapter 10. So that way you guys can get hands on with it. Um, but utilize your time while you're in school, like on campus. Um, 
like I said, you have so many hours, you know, for the first half of your day for instrumentation. We will be laying out new instruments, um, but you're just going to have to kind of utilize your time frame. Like, you know, try to learn your instruments that are coming out. And then also I'm going to pull out the things that go with the second part of chapter 10. Okay, because you're going to have to learn your supplies and all as well. So you just have to kind of utilize your time and kind of make sure that you're always busy, you know, doing something. Okay. Um, it's going to be a lot of things that you guys are going to see as far as supplies go and dra uh, drapes and dressing. So I think the more and more it's in front of your face, the more you're going to be familiar with it. So eventually it's going to become really easy for you. Okay. Some of the equipment you may not see often. So, you know, we all might forget every now and then what it is until you see it again or actually get hands on with it. Okay, so you're going to learn more instruments. Some of them are going to be repetitive that you've already learned from your basics. Um, you're just going to add new ones. And then, like I said, I'm going to pull out stuff for equipment and supplies because you will have a supply quiz as well on there. Okay, on your laps and your Ratex and stuff. So, all right, I don't want to keep you past an hour. So just like really any questions or anything you guys can think of? Mm -hmm. You're good. Like I said, make sure you read your note pages, look in your supply books. Um, and I'm going to finish up the second half of the, um, the PowerPoint. So, and like I said, there's pictures all over. I've been adding to the PowerPoint, trying to label them and all. So they may not be in order of what's on the list, but you just got to go back and forth. At least you have a visual in front of your face at that time to actually go back and look at. Okay. So a lot of the students last year had said they liked at least having a quick little reference photo on the PowerPoint. So I continue, I'm just adding more, you know, this year for y'all. So, all righty. I mean, that's it. If you guys have any questions, y'all can stay on um, or knock on the door virtually. I'll, you know, whenever today I'll be here, just leaving it open. So, other than that, that's it. Y'all are dismissed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all. Welcome. Bye. Bye. Oh, see, I think that's.